Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Despite a human cost which far exceeded that of all other wars fought by Britain since World War II, little is remembered of the bravery and sacrifice of British soldiers during the Korean War. Upon the attack on South Korea in the summer of 1950, British troops stationed in Hong Kong were hastily sent to support their American allies and defend what little territory remained under southern control. These men, who formed the 27th Infantry Brigade and 4-1 Commando, knew little, if anything, about Korea prior to their deployment. Yet, they undertook some of the war's most critical missions. Our guest for this episode, author and journalist Andrew Solomon, wrote two books documenting the deployment of British forces during the war. Scorched Earth, Black Snow covers the 27th Brigade and 4-1 Commando in the second half of 1950, from hasty preparations in Hong Kong to desperate battles in the Korean winter. To the Last Round, set in 1951, follows Britain's 29th Infantry Brigade and sheds light on one of its battalions, who fought an entire Chinese army to the very last cartridge near the Imjin River despite being surrounded and utterly outnumbered. In this interview, we talked about the significance of the Korean War for Britain, the importance of preserving the memory of these men and their sacrifice, and what the author tried to convey with his book. Andrew Solomon covers the Korean Peninsula for Forbes, the Washington Times, the Daily Telegraph, and the South China Morning Post. He is also a frequent contributor to major South Korean outlets. In addition to his books on the Korean War, he also wrote Modern Korea, All That Matters, an introductory book on modern Korean history, and is now interested in researching the history of Seoul. Andrew Solomon holds a BA in history and literature from the University of Kent at Canterbury, as well as an MA in Asian Studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Andrew Solomon, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. What brought you to Korea? Yeah, well, that was a long, long time ago. I first came here to practice uh, a Korean martial art called Hapkido. Had no real plans to stay very long, but uh, I'm not a great life planner. One thing led to another. I ended up getting married, and um, yeah, here I am. You wrote two books about British and Australian forces during the Korean War. Mm. Why did you decide to write about those topics? For several reasons. Um, firstly, I'm a writer. That's what I do as a profession. I think like most journalists, most print journalists, um, one wants to write a book. A book becomes your legacy. It's, uh, it's much bigger than writing a story for a newspaper or a magazine. Right? Um, secondly, I've always read history, and particularly military history. And of course, this was a Korean War story, so it was on my doorstep, pretty much. Um, and the third reason is, I mean, they're just great stories which hadn't been told before. The Korean War is called the Forgotten War, and it is pretty much forgotten. It's, you could also call it the Unpublished War. There aren't really that many books about it in print, or there haven't been for the last 10, 15 years. And so it was virtually terra incognito. So I thought, you know, I should fill this space before these old guys, when I spoke to them, they're in their 70s, now most of them are in their 80s, before they disappeared and took their stories to the grave with them. As you mentioned, it's a forgotten war. Not much has been published, but when thinking about the Korean War, mm. the actors that show up most easily are America, sure. North Korea, South Korea, mm. and even the Chinese army. But we never really think about Australia or the UK. Why is that? Well, I mean, it's understandable that people think about the Americans first and foremost. America is the world's largest economy, it's the largest soft power, it runs Hollywood, it's got a huge publications and media industries, so you know, American stories are well told in the global space. Secondly, of course, America was far and away the biggest contingent of the uh, foreign UN command contingents. The, la the second largest was the UK, but the Americans suffered 33,000 killed in action, the British suffered about 1,100 killed in action. So that just shows you just how huge the American presence was compared to the other UN contingents. So, you know, economy of scale is an issue. And of course, we know about the North and South Koreans because, well, you know, this war still goes on and we read about it on the front page of our newspapers probably several times a year. And of course, China. Uh, it was a particularly important war for China because China we now think of as an economic superpower, but it first became a, a military superpower in Korea 
in November 1950, China literally struck from nowhere and astonished the world. So I think for those reasons, that's why, well, that, to answer your question, why the American, Chinese and North and South Koreans are remembered for the Korean War, but all the other UN forces, be they British, Turkish, Belgian, French, Colombian, Ethiopian, Australian, Canadian, and there are others I haven't mentioned. I mean, there are 18 combatant nations. So that explains why Australia and the UK are not really remembered outside. But what about domestically? Why don't the UK remember the Korean War that well? Iraq is often yeah. considered to be a brutal war. Yeah. Um, but you write in your book that, and I quote, the Korean War remains by far the biggest, bloodiest, most brutal war fought by British troops since World War II. Yeah, I mean, put it this way. If you combine the Falklands War, the Iraq War, and the Afghan War, which are our three most recent major wars, and you combine all the killed in action from those wars, there would still be less than the number of men we lost in Korea. And Korea was a short war, three years. So that was no exaggeration. For the UK, this was our bloodiest war since World War II to this day. Why is it forgotten? You know, to be perfectly honest, I'm not really sure. Um, I'll give you a number of reasons. One, it took place very, very soon after World War II. And of course, the British pu public at that time were just war weary. They didn't want to hear about another war. When we fought World War II, by declaring war on Germany, we threw our national existence into the balance. It was a life or death struggle. Korea was a very distant obligation, which we were obliged to discharge because of our alliance with the United States. Most people in the UK had never heard of Korea back then. And to this day in, in the UK, Korea is not nearly as widely known as a brand as Japan or China. So Korea and the Korean War weren't popular and weren't widely known even at the time. I think since then, of course, it's become fairly distant history. This took place in, in the 50s. And people are naturally much more focused on recent events. That's true of all areas of human endeavor. So there's the issue of time, knowledge, distance, and of course the, the defining issue, I think, is popular culture. And this is true for the Americans as well. Korea never captured the imagination of great novelists or great filmmakers the way World War II did, or even Vietnam did. So those are firmly entrenched in the popular mind from books and movies. Platoon, quartered safe out here, Apocalypse Now, the Cruel Sea, The Dam Busters, you know, great works of film and, and literature which came out of those conflicts. If you ask me a great film about Korea or a great book about Korea, um, difficult to point to any in the English language. Could you maybe give some numbers? You already mentioned how many deaths there were, the number of troops present in Korea, how long they stayed, their involvement in general. Yeah, uh, the guys here were on one-year tours, so they fought one year, um, and after that first winter of war, that horrific war winter, um, of 1950-51, it was decided by the Imperial General Staff, we can't ask our guys to go through another winter like that. So it was a one-year tour. Um, throughout the three years of war, I believe about 80,000 plus British soldiers rotated through Korea. My books don't cover the bulk of the war. My books cover just the, literally the first year, uh, less than the first year actually, from um, June 1950 through to April 51. But those were far and away the most dramatic times of the Korean War. These were immense offensives up and down the peninsula and these stunning reversals of fortune. In the last two years of the war, it's a pretty static, rather dull war, almost like a World War I style war, fixed front, not much movement, not a lot happening, just nasty attritional battles taking place. And so the term the Forgotten War was actually applied in, I think, 52 or 53. So it was forgotten by the publics back home. It's just this simmering war going on somewhere out in Asia. Could you maybe give us some American, Chinese or South Korean numbers to compare? I don't know how many the Chinese deployed. They lost 187,000 men. The Americans, again, I'm not sure how many rotated through. They were far and away the biggest force, as I just mentioned. Um, the South Koreans, it was a nation under arms, pretty much anyone walking the streets between the ages of 16 and 40. I mean, just look at some of the photographs. I mean, kids in uniform were being plucked up and thrust into combat by either the North Korean People's Army or the uh, Republic of Korea Army. So pretty much every male was either fighting in a, a frontline unit, a, a rear echelon unit, a police unit, you know, policing guerrillas in the rear, or um, working as a porter or something for the uh, the UN command. 
And what, oh, and when I say a nation under arms, of course, I mean two nations under arms, North and South Korea. In your most recent book, yeah. Scorched Earth, Black Snow, you focus on two British detachments, the 27th Brigade mm -hmm. and the 4-1 Commando. Can you introduce right. these forces to our listeners? Why were they sent to the Korean theater and what were they tasked with? Okay, 27th Infantry Brigade was a brigade which was actually deployed in Hong Kong when the Korean War broke out, which was the best place in the world to be a British soldier in those days, right? You didn't want to be in Europe, this broken, devastated, poor, cold, dark, miserable continent. Otherwise, you might be fighting guerrillas in the Malayan jungle or somewhere. You didn't really want to be there. So Hong Kong was a great place to be. And when the Korean War broke out and America asked for British assistance, the Imperial General Reserve, which was 29th Brigade in the UK, was just not ready to go. This was the state of the British Army at the time. In the post-war period, it lost a lot of funding, lost a huge amount of manpower, and the so-called quick reaction force just wasn't good to go. So a snap decision was made, let's deploy 27th Brigade from Hong Kong to, to join fighting alongside the Americans and South Koreans on the Busan perimeter in summer of 1950. Remember, North Korea almost won the Korean War. It had really pushed back Allied forces to a perimeter just around Daegu and Busan. The rest of the peninsula was, was dyed red. So these guys were sent at a week's notice, and a brigade is usually three battalions of infantry, about 600 men each, and a brigade normally has its own artillery, its guns and its armour, you know, tanks, scout cars and so on. This brigade was just put together literally at a week's notice and was just two battalions with very, very little supportive service. They relied on the Americans for that. And 27th Brigade would soon be joined by a third unit, which was possibly the best infantry unit in the Korean War, in my opinion. And that was 3rd Battalion Royal Australian Regiment, a really tough, elite, all-volunteer force who joined 27th Brigade on the ground in Korea. So then you had these three battalions, two British, one Australian, fighting together. Um, the second unit you, you just mentioned was 4-1 Commando Royal Marines. This was um, a Special Forces unit. If I recall correctly, MacArthur had specifically asked for British Special Forces um, to conduct commando raids into North Korea behind enemy lines because the, the British Army and British Armed Forces had developed that as a speciality in World War II, the commandos, the SAS, SOE and so forth. But after World War II, a lot of those units were, um, were disbanded. They were not regular units, but the Royal Marines maintained commando forces. So they, uh, the Royal Navy, the Royal Marines, put together a special about 230-man raiding force, 4-1 commando, and deployed them to Korea to carry out attacks on the North Korean infrastructure way up in North Korea, behind the lines. The book follows these soldiers during what you call, and I'm quoting again, the war's most dramatic period, summer to the end of the year of the tiger, 1950. Correct. What happened during those months, and why was it such a crucial period uh, in the war? Uh, for every reason. Okay, the war started in, on June 25th, uh, 1950, uh, with a series of victories by the North Korean People's Army. They come down the peninsula, they take Seoul, they, as I said, they just t took most of the peninsula, the Americans arrive, are defeated, defeated, and then their line, the front line, solidifies around Daegu and Busan. Then MacArthur embarks his best troops, which are the US Marines, and sails right round the enemy's flank. Uh, again, most of the fighting now is around Pusan. He lands 200 miles in the North Korean rear and lands at Incheon and takes Seoul. So now it looks like the war is over. The North Korean People's Army is defeated. Um, South Korea is liberated. Then Syngman Rhee, the South Korean president, and he was pretty close to MacArthur, they shared similar aims, decides let's finish this job, let's unify Korea. So rock troops, soon followed by UN command troops, including the Americans, the British and Australians, uh, then strike north over the parallel. And again, they eat up the enemy, they're defeating the North Korean People's Army, and about 30, 40 miles south of the Yalu River, suddenly, out of nowhere, China strikes. And so now we've gone from what was a civil war to then a, a war with a UN force to what looks like World War III, the communists have struck. And this horrific winter campaign in North Korea, which was, and during that campaign, you saw the bloodiest battlefield defeat suffered by the US Army anywhere in the world since World War II, the uh, virtual destruction of 2nd Infantry Division at the Kunari Pass. And you saw this extraordinary epic breakout from the mountains to the sea by the 1st US Marine Division and 4-1 Commando, who were surrounded in the North Korean mountains 
by eight Chinese divisions. So you have a disaster and then this epic retreat to the sea and then it's the end of the year. So in that one year, you see the North Korean People's Army almost wins the war, is almost destroyed. Korea is almost reunified by the UN forces, then suddenly China comes south. And that all happens in the space of months. You imply that these troops, the British and Australian troops, mm. prevented the total annihilation of South Korea following North Korea's initial surprise attack. How was their contribution so crucial? Why was it? I, I, yeah, I'm not sure if I ever said or wrote that. Um, I did say the UN command uh, as a whole certainly saved South Korea from disappearing from the map. Had the Americans and later other UN troops not intervened, then South Korea, place in which we're sitting right now, uh, would no longer exist. Uh, would be in North Korea, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. So the UN, I mean, the British forces, they were the second largest contingent after the Americans, and they played vital roles in a number of battles. Um, they were the first UN command force to deploy alongside the Americans in the war. They were the spearhead of the attack uh, north of Pyongyang. They were the rear guard during the retreat from North Korea. Both of those are pretty critical roles. And again, 4-1 Commando played a pretty significant role in the, uh, the fighting around Chosun Reservoir, and the fighting particularly at Hellfire Valley, which was a, a very important action. So they, they played very significant roles, as they would later in the war, most significantly, I think, at the Battle of Imjin River, which was the biggest communist attack, not just of the Korean War, but anywhere in the world since 1945. And a British unit was at the very epicenter of that attack, uh, joined by a Belgian battalion, I should add. Uh, so that was a very critical role they played then as well. But to say they, they saved South Korea, that's overstating the case. That, I think, that honor must go to the Americans. What is striking in your book is how ill-prepared and ill-equipped mm. these British troops are. You mentioned that they did not really have mm. um, equipment in Hong sure. Kong. Did that situation improve over time or was it just the way they fought? <laughs> no, I think uh, you know it's the case that British troops have always been badly equipped at the beginning of a war. Um, if we go back to the Crimean War, World War II, um, our enemies always tend to have better equipment and so on. So yeah, this was not an unusual experience if you look at recent British military history. The thing was they, they were pretty well trained and of course we we're backed up by the Americans and very well supplied in some cases by the Americans who I think have got the, uh, the finest military logistical force on earth. So uh, in that sense in terms of clothing and vehicular support and so on, yeah, the Americans were critical in keeping the British in the fight. Yeah. How was the relationship between British troops and the Americans you just mentioned, you read that British forces were eager to come and save the American forces just like they had been saved during World War II. Uh, did that happen? And that, how was the uh, Yeah, again, that was a quote from one of the, uh, the soldiers. They said it was unusual for us them to call, for, call us for help. Um, so, you know, we were keen to go in. I, again, I'm not sure if save is the right word, but yes, yeah, certainly uh, in World War One and World War Two, it'd been the, the British who'd been begging the Americans to intervene. And this time it's the Americans begging its, its allies, come on, join us, you know, we need a united front against communism in, uh, in East Asia. Because again, it's, it's, it was believed at the time that this was a concerted action by, by Stalin, by Mao and by Kim, we now know, since so many records have been declassified behind the, uh, the Iron Curtain, that actually this was really Kim Il-sung's initiative. Um, Stalin was semi on board, Mao was semi on board, and uh, just the situation spiraled out of control. You write that these men were motivated by what you call the cult of the unit. Hmm. War meant battle honors. How did these men create such strong bonds that they were willing to, and even eager to be deployed in a thoroughly foreign land and commit, well, acts of bravery, uh, despite having, as you mentioned earlier, no real patriotic incentive unlike World War II. Right, yeah, I mean, the patriotic incentive was to, uh, to fight boldly for the unit, which of course was a national unit. But no, I think um, this is not unique to the British Army, but good units, probably the same for good corporations, good sports teams, are cohesive. They believe in their brand, they reinforce each other, uh, reinforce each other's courage, their successes, and so if you have a, a, a group or a unit that's cohesive and has the same aims, I think it'll do well in, probably in, in any endeavor. Uh, but of course, we're talking about the military sphere. What interests me is that you know, an army is basically composed of men, 
doing the same job, wearing the exact same uniform, carrying the same weapons, right? They're all, they're not individuals, they're all groups. So how do groups within an army identify themselves? And, uh, and this is what branding is all about. You know, how do you brand one product or service as being different from all the many similar products and service? What makes Coke different from Pepsi? I think the British Army may have sort of unconsciously invented this, this concept of branding because, and this goes back at least two centuries, all these identical units which were formed from people from the same part of the country. You'd have the Gloucester Regiment came from Gloucestershire in the southwest. You'd have the, uh, the Middlesex Regiment, which came from London. You'd have the Royal Ulster Rifles, which came from Ulster. Within these units, which again, all wore identical clothing, had the same equipment, they would differentiate themselves from each other by sort of certain insignia, just to make themselves a little different. Uh, the personality of the battalion commander or the regimental commander. And so these units would, would forge their own identity within the wider army. The 27th Infantry Brigade mm. is first assigned to the Nakdong River area, yeah. which turned out to be, a, and I quote you again, an unexpectedly gentle introduction. Yeah. The North Korean offensive against the Pusan perimeter at the end of August was rapidly losing steam yeah. as American forces, as you mentioned, are starting to gain territory back. This meant, however, that the forces uh, in the UN would switch from defensive to offensive. Yeah. How did things go from then on for the brigade, uh, especially in September and October 1950. Well, yeah, the uh, 27th Brigade took part in the first significant UN offensive after the landing at Incheon, which was completely unconnected. The guys on the ground didn't know that had taken place. So the first main ground offensive was the attack across the Nakdong River, which, as you say, the North Korean army had pretty much broken its teeth on the Pusan perimeter defences. Uh, there was still a formidable force but uh, now it was the UN force that would go on the offensive. So 27th Brigade took part in this major operation across the night on. Uh, they took their first objective, the Middlesex Regiment, a London-based unit, took their first objective. Uh, the second objective was uh, assigned to the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, which was the brigade's second battalion. And they had a, a very, very... Uh, nasty battle on this hill because what happened was um, and this was a miscommunication with the Americans and it's not entirely clear how it happened the UN Air Force uh, the US Air Force rather bombed the Argyles who were defending themselves against the North Korean counterattack at close range on a hilltop um, they bombed them with napalm and pretty much incinerated about 70 men within seconds which was a very very um, pleasant introduction to war fighting for these men was a near disaster for the battalion who managed to retrieve itself. Won the battalion, one of uh, the, well, the very first Victoria Cross of the war. The VC, the Victoria Cross, is the highest award for uh, gallantry the British Empire can award. And this was awarded on that day to an officer who lost his life. You mentioned earlier that mm. the entry of the Chinese forces, the mm. army of ghosts, would actually literally change the course of the battle. Of the war. Of yeah. the war, yes. Were the British troops aware of what was going on when they were participating in that? Yeah, I mean, the, the original job had been the objective of the UN intervention had been to defend South Korea from communism. When the uh, a UN resolution sponsored at American behest by the British was pushed through the UN to counter-invade North Korea and unify the uh, Korean Peninsula, and then there'll be nationwide democratic elections. I don't think this is well related to the men on the ground. It's just like, uh, well, boys, we're heading north. Um, again, these guys didn't have much idea of Korean geography. Most of the guys who were not officers hadn't seen large-scale maps. So a lot of the guys, okay, we're heading to Pyongyang, huh? Where's that? But those who did know, some of the well-informed ones, were um, some, a few of them, and maybe this with hindsight, said this seemed to be, this wasn't the original mission. This seemed to be mission creep in modern terms. And one of the guys says, uh, we realize we're crossing the frontier uh, because we're in a convoy of vehicles going across and we saw these sort of skeletons in, in ripped up uniforms standing in smashed up field fortifications. And we realized we're crossing the 38th parallel. And those, um, those dead bodies who were killed standing up, they were killed fighting, were the uh, South Korean defenders of the frontier from the first night of the war. There's a chilling quote in your book from Middlesex Private James Beverly. The hills in front of us just change colors. Can you maybe tell us more about this quote? And yeah, what? sure. No, that, that, that was a great uh, quote. When the Chinese first appeared, and again, this is an army using mass in a tactical sense, a lot of guys, 
He said, yeah, uh, something had happened. We didn't know what was happening. We're hearing confused radio messages. He was on an outpost, you know, winter's descending. He's up very close to Manchuria, now about 35 five miles south of the Yalu. Um, they've been told, guys, we need to pack up. We're going back to Hong Kong soon. We'll be home by Christmas. The Korean War is over because the North Korean army is virtually defeated. And then he said, we, we've got all these alarming radio messages, the Americans to our east have run into something bad, we don't know what it is. And then he says, I was, you know, I was looking, I didn't have binoculars, and just naked eye. I was looking at this hill in front of me and it started changing colour. What the hell is that? He sort of looked closely, it was just swarms of men charging down the hill. And this was the, uh, the arrival of the Chinese, and that same event, which was the Battle of Pakchon, up in North Korea, a very desperate battle, the, the brigade fought. One of the officers said, I was looking at the ridge alongside the road and it was like a, a forest was moving along the ridge. And again, I couldn't work out what it was. And then I realised it was uh, Chinese troops and they'd put foliage in their hats for top cover against uh, UN aircraft just advancing in file hundreds or thousands along this ridge. And he was reminded of that famous quote from Macbeth, till Burnham Wood, till Dunsinane do come, which is when... Uh, I think it's Macduff's army, you know, do the same thing. They, uh, they disguise themselves as a walking forest. So, yeah, that was the first sight these guys had of the Chinese. It was a, a formidable sight. And I think neither of those guys will forget it until their, their dying day. As a result, everything goes downside in the winter months right. uh, of November and December. Can you walk us through the final weeks of 1950? Basically, the Chinese army took complete tactical control of the battlefield. The UN forces, most particularly the Americans, but also the ROCs and the other Allied forces, which at that stage were the British, the Australians and the Turkish, who had literally just arrived in time for the catastrophe, were a road-bound army. And of course, the Korean roads in those days were just single dirt tracks sneaking through hills, and they were holding sort of hilltop strong points. There was no single front line. But the Chinese, you know, an army with a guerrilla heritage, would move cross-country at night or undercover. Uh, so they were pretty much invisible. They had very, very good camouflage and concealment. And they were completely inaudible. They were silent because they didn't use radios. They didn't have radios to use. So we couldn't see them. We couldn't hear them. They were fighting a different kind of war. As I said, these are, they're using a tactic from, uh, really from Sun Tzu, who said, make your attack like water which means you have a mass of men and you try to over, over, overrun the hilltop strong points held by the UN forces. So you're like a wave attacking over these, these hills. But if your attack is repulsed at the same time as the frontal attack goes in, you have units infiltrating around the flanks, you know, like water streaming around a rock and setting up positions in your rear. And this was a brilliantly effective tactic which completely unhinged an entire South Korean Corps, which almost wiped out the uh, American 2nd Infantry Division, and later in the war almost wiped out the British 29th Brigade. So a very, very effective tactic for what's been called a, a very unsophisticated army. I think that's wrong. You just mentioned the 29th Brigade. In your book, To the Last Round, the epic British stand on the Imjin River, Korea 1951, right. you give a full account mm. of what happened. Sadly enough, an entire British battalion was wiped out. Mm. Could you tell us more of, about what the 29th Battalion was supposed to do on the Imjin River? The book we talked about previously, Scorched Earth, Black Snow, covers the fighting a little bit in South Korea, mostly in North Korea in that hideous winter of 1950. To the last round covers the biggest Chinese attack of the war, which was the Spring Offensive of 1951. What the Chinese aimed to do was to break through on a couple of key sections of the front, encircle the bulk of the UN command, annihilate it, wipe it out, a Carthage-style battle of annihilation, and then capture Seoul by May Day. What actually happened was one of the two key breakthrough points along the front was held by uh, four battalions of 29th Brigade, which was the second British unit to deploy. They were the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers, the Gloucester Regiment, the Royal Ulster Rifles, and they'd been joined just a few days, sorry, about a week before this massive offensive was launched by a Belgian battalion who just arrived in Korea. So it's a four battalion fight against 24 Chinese battalions. So basically it's the story of a brigade against an army. 
to me, an epic story. I don't use that term lightly. For the British people, this is the bloodiest battle the British Army has fought anywhere in the world since World War II. It has become an iconic battle in the same way for British people that maybe Hastings, Agincourt, Dunkirk, Arnhem are. It's, it's a known battle. And yet, it, out of all those iconic battles, a lot of people know the name Imjin River, but don't know much about what really happened. Um, so again, this goes back to it being the Forgotten War. And my book tell, tells or, or tries to tell that story. But yeah, it is to date the, the fullest account of that battle that became a tragedy. Could you maybe tell us very quickly what strategy uh, the UN forces adopted to fight off the Chinese wave? Well, there wasn't really a strategy at the beginning because the, this attack, like so many of the Chinese attacks, came out of nowhere. We just didn't have good intelligence. Uh, it was believed an offensive was massing somewhere up in the north, but it wasn't clear how big it would be, when it was going to attack, and what the main point of the attack would be. And the intelligence got it wrong, uh, which is why 29th Brigade was kind of caught in this hurricane uh, for three, three days and three nights of battle on the Imjin River. Now, the Imjin Valley is directly north of Seoul, about 35, yeah, 35 miles north of Seoul. And it's the last significant geographic obstacle before you reach the Han River Valley and Seoul. So it's critical. And it's been, I take tours up there. And uh, the fortifications we visit are still held to this day by South Korean troops, the same positions which were held by the British in 1951. And there are Schiller dynasty fortifications on the same site. It's really strategic, blood-soaked terrain. And so the, the strategy, if you can call it that, was simply to hold off the Chinese as long as possible, then fall back to the next phase line. When the entire UN line fell back after the first three days of this tremendous battle, a third of a million Chinese troops surging south, one British battalion couldn't extricate, was left behind, three miles behind enemy lines, and after a three-night fight, was surrounded and destroyed after um, a fight that's been called heroic. Um, not by British, but by American troops. Uh, U.S. General, General Van Fleet, who was the commander of UN forces at the time, called the last stand of the, the, the Gloucesters, just south of the Imjin River, as the greatest example of unit bravery in modern warfare. Could you maybe walk us through their battle during their last hours? They were cut off from the rest of the brigade after the first night of battle. The second night, a company was wiped out by a regiment. And the third night, this what remained of the battalion, they'd lost by this time about 150, 160 men. 400 left on a this napalm-scorched hilltop, completely surrounded. Um, hold the ground all night, fight off the ground. And the following morning, they're expected to be relieved by a US brigade force, a regimental combat team. But now the Americans were also in trouble, and they deployed that force to cover their own line of withdrawal. So there was, uh, again, this rather tragic radio conversation by um, 29th Brigade's commander, uh, Tom Brody, and uh, Colonel James Kahn, who was the commander of the Gloucester Battalion. Uh, in which you just told him, we're afraid that, that the American relief force is not coming to your aid. You're on your own. So they tried to break out of the trap and they failed. 60 men managed to get out. Uh, the rest were killed, wounded or prisoners. So the Gloucester Battalion was essentially wiped out as a fighting force. But after holding a critical pass through the hills uh, that the Chinese really wanted to take, for three nights. And if you read the Chinese after action reports, why their, their biggest ever offensive failed, um, they say, well, our, our troops had difficulty deploying in the close terrain of the Imjin Valley. And I think that's a, a tremendous tribute to 29th Brigade and of course the Gloucesters who, who were wiped out, but managed to, um, to hold the Chinese for, for three nights during the shock period of their offensive because the Chinese had such poor logistics, they could only sustain an attack for about seven days and nights. So that stand was really absolutely critical. Yeah. You mentioned that some men were actually taken prisoners, mm. were they able to get back to the West? Yes, uh, at the end of the war. To the best of my knowledge, no one who was taken prisoner and taken to the North Korean prison camps just south of the Yalu ever escaped from the camps. And the camps were not prison camps the way we think about them. You know, minefields, barbed wire, guard towers with machine guns and so on. They were literally just villages 
where, where the prisoners live, because where would you escape to? China, that was an enemy state. How could you escape through you know, two or 300 miles of North Korea when you're a, you know, a Caucasian? It just wasn't feasible. So um, yeah, they, a lot of them made escape attempts. None of them made it. And they were released at, at the end of the war during the prisoner exchange in 1953. And of course, one Briton and I think 21 or 22 Americans defected. They decided, you know, we, uh, we're not gonna go back to our own countries, we'll go to Beijing as did thousands of communist prisoners in the south uh, in the prison camps down in near um, Pusan in Koje Island. Uh, Singh and reopened the gates and these guys just swarmed out and defected to, uh, to South Korea. And this is a bit off topic admittedly, yeah. but those men who defected to Beijing, were yeah. they welcome? Uh, they were at the time. They were a very useful propaganda coup for the Beijing regime, but not one of them stayed there more than a few years. They all kind of quietly returned home. Uh, and I think the, the governments, the British and American governments, actually treated them quite well. I mean, those guys could, under some interpretation of the law, have been shot as traitors. But I think they're allowed to just live fairly quiet lives. This is maybe an easy question, but could you maybe share with us one or two anecdotes uh, that you think best captured the odds of this British soldier uh, when facing the Chinese and the North Korean army? The last night on the Imjin River, when, again, situation... You're on a decimated battalion. You've been fighting for two nights. Night is falling on the third night. All your frontline positions have been overrun or pushed back. The last of the battalion are all deployed around this hilltop. And the Chinese are, are literally all around you. And the battalion padre, Sam Davis, said, um, we've been looking at the hills around us during the day. And if you kind of half closed your eyes, You, you might imagine it was Gloucester, because the Imogen River Valley is really quite beautiful, low rolling hills, and it looks a little bit like southwest England if you're a bit stressed, you're tired, um, and you're very worried about the future. It could almost look a little bit like home. And he wrote in his memoirs that um, we just prayed for the clock to slow down, because we knew as soon as darkness fell, the Chinese would attack again with the intention of liquidating us, so that we knew this could be our last afternoon. And he says, as darkness fell, and I looked, this was the Padre, you know, a, a man of God. I looked all around, 360 degrees, and um, all around us, all you could see in the, in the darkness were just fires burning everywhere from the, from the napalm, from the artillery and the ground scrub, burning innumerable fires in this bloody sunset. And he said, uh, to me, this looked like, you know, the apocalypse. And of course, that night very nearly was uh, for him and his mates. Another one, I'll talk about not the war, but the effects of war. I, I don't believe in ghosts, okay? I never have. But I, one guy told me a story that made me kind of reconsider why, you know, maybe this, is, this was a real ghost for this guy. He was with 29th Brigade. He fought a very nasty battle, fought of, north of Seoul during the, the January breakthrough, the January the first attack, uh, the New Year's Day offensive, when 268,000 Chinese bayonets crossed the Imjin River, swept everything before them, and the British were the last line of defense north of Seoul. And uh, he said, I was actually the forward most man in my company. My company was the forward most company in the battalion. My battalion was the forward most battalion in the brigade, and the brigade was the foremost unit in the UN forces at that time. I was literally the tip of the spear. And the morning of January the 4th, freezing cold, I was in this freezing cold foxhole, snow on the ground. As it gets light, someone stood up in front of me and it was a Chinese reconnaissance soldier. And this guy was so close and the Chinese were so good at this kind of fighting that my rifle barrel was touching his chest. I mean, literally whites their eyes. So I pulled the trigger, shot this very young soldier, this 18, 19 year old kid who fell on top of me, that's how close they were. And I pushed him off and he fell into the trench next to me. And then the Chinese mass stood up, you know, further down the hill and we were fighting all day. And we managed to get out through Seoul, which was burning uh, and the city was being blown up behind us. So a pretty traumatic experience. And he said that, you know, throughout that day of fighting, this Chinese kid, I'd shot him through the lungs and he was just choking to death for hours next to me. And I never forgot that. There was nothing we could do for him. Anyway, he survived that battle. He survived the battle of the Imjin River, where again, he was involved in very close combat. And he went back to the UK, left the army. And I think in the 1970s, you know, 20 plus years after the Korean War had finished, 
he said, uh, I was asleep in my bedroom around midnight. I, I felt a strange malevolent presence. And I opened my eyes and there was someone sitting at the edge of my bed, at the foot of my bed. And as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I, didn't, I was terrified. I didn't dare reach out and turn on the light. Uh, I could see it was this Chinese soldier sitting there in his snowy uniform with a hole in his chest and blood flooding out of this, uh, this sucking chest wound. And he was just sitting there looking at me and I looked at him and he said, uh, I had this vista for years and years and years, most nights. I saw psychiatrists, I saw psychologists, I saw doctors, I saw priests, none of them could, could help me. I thought I was going mad. And uh, one of his friends said, look, um, why don't you go back to Korea, see what it's like now? And he said, no, I don't ever want to go back to that country. It was, it was just a horror show. I don't ever want to see it again. But he was convinced to go on a veterans revisit. And uh, when he came to Seoul, of course, the veterans just don't recognize it. It's an incredible place. And this is the, the victory of South Korea. South Korea couldn't win the war, but it, but it won the peace. It's now a very impressive nation. And uh, he was in his hotel and he broke his belt on his trousers. So he went to the hotel gift shop to buy a new belt. And the guy in the gift shop said, um, are you one of the Korean War veterans? He said, yes, I am. He said, well, let me give this belt to you for free. There's no charge. And the guy said, you know, when that happened, I just broke down in tears. It was a real act of human kindness. I hadn't expected it. And just everything flooded out of me. And uh, after that event and that revisit to South Korea, where it was clear that the sacrifices were worthwhile, this was a good war to fight, his ghost was exorcised. He, he never saw it again. Could you maybe tell us what was the involvement of the British troops after the Imjin uh, River and until the end of the war? After the Imjin River battle, all the Commonwealth forces, which were the British, the Australian, the Canadians, and the New Zealands, were put together in a single division, the first Commonwealth division, quite a sizable unit. And for the rest of the war, they defended the, uh, yeah, the Imjin Valley, which is directly north of Seoul, uh, alongside the first US Marine Division. So those were arguably the two best divisions in Korea at the time, first US Marines, first Commonwealth, and they held the strategic ground directly north of Seoul during the static fighting uh, for two years. How are these events remembered in Great Britain and Australia? Australia, I'm not so sure. I spoke to a lot of Australian veterans, but uh, I'll answer for the UK. I would say these are remembered by Korean War veterans, by some of their family members, and that's pretty much it. I think if you ask a lot of British people, um, what do you know about the Korean War? They would be able to tell you virtually nothing. Uh, I am very pleased, however, that thanks to South Korean government funding, a Korean War Memorial has finally been raised in the UK in a pretty prominent spot in London. So there is now a memorial to, uh, to the men who fought here, who fought, as I said, what I think was, in hindsight, a very just war. Is there any lesson, any deeper meaning to these stories of war? I just see them as tremendous human stories. I'm not trying to draw any great national narrative type uh, lesson from them. Other books, other historians have tried to do that. I think my contribution to the uh, to human knowledge of the Korean War is just to capture the stories, not of the generals, not of the politicians, but of the men who are on the ground fighting the war, experiencing these horrific, traumatic, and in some cases, exciting and inspirational events for posterity. What's it like to face the fire? That's what I was interested in. Andrew Solomon, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.